sin. We are told to transcend all thoughts, but are not good thoughts helpful in seeking realization, at any rate in the early stages, like the lower rungs of the ladder? Yes, insofar as they keep off bad thoughts, but they themselves must disappear before the state of realization, because the quality of purity, sattva, is the real nature of the mind. Clearness, like that of the unclouded sky, is the characteristic of the mind expanse. Being stirred up by the quality of activity, rajas, the mind becomes restless and influenced by darkness, tamas, manifests as the physical world. The mind thus becoming restless on the one hand and appearing as solid matter on the other, the real is not discerned. Just as fine silk threads cannot be woven with the use of a heavy iron shuttle, or the delicate shades of a work of art be distinguished in the light of a lamp flickering in the wind, so is realization of truth impossible, with the mind rendered gross by darkness, tamas, and restless by activity, rajas, because truth is exceedingly subtle and serene. Mind will be cleared of its impurities only by a desireless performance of duties during several births, getting a worthy master, learning from him, and incessantly practicing meditation on the Supreme. The transformation of the mind into the world of inert matter due to the quality of darkness, tamas, and its restlessness due to the quality of activity, Rajas will cease. Then the mind regains its subtlety and composure. The bliss of the self can manifest only in a mind rendered subtle and steady by assiduous meditation. He who experiences that bliss is liberated even while still alive. I am a sinner and I do not perform any religious duties. Shall I have a painful rebirth because of that? Why do you say you are a sinner? Faith in God is enough to save you from rebirth. Cast all your burden on Him. In the Tiruvachakam it is said, Though I am worse than a dog, you have graciously undertaken to protect me. The delusion of death and birth is maintained by you. Is it for me? To sit and judge, am I the Lord here? Almighty God, it is for you to roll me through many bodies or keep me fixed at your feet. Therefore, have faith and that will save you. There is more pleasure in meditation than in sensual enjoyment. And yet the mind seeks the latter, not the former. Why is that? Pleasure and pain are only aspects of the mind. Our essential nature is happiness, but we have forgotten the self and imagine that the body or the mind is the self. It is this wrong identification that gives rise to misery. What is to be done? This tendency is very deep-rooted and has continued for many past births and so has grown strong. It will have to go before the essential nature, which is happiness, can be realized. Swami, how can the grip of the ego be loosened? By not adding new vasanas, bad habits, to it. Why are there good and evil in the world? They are relative terms. There must be a subject to know the good and evil. That subject is the ego. It ends in the self. Or you can say that the source of the ego is God. This definition is probably more definite and understandable for you. God All religions postulate the three fundamentals, the world, the soul, and God. But it is the one reality that manifests itself as these three. One can say, the three are really three only so long as the ego lasts, Therefore, to inhere in one's own being, when the ego is dead, 
is the perfect state. The world is real. No, it is mere illusory appearance. The world is conscious. No, the world is happiness. No. What use is it to argue thus? That state is agreeable to all, wherein having given up the objective outlook, one knows oneself, and loses all notions either of unity or duality of oneself and the ego. If one has formed oneself, the world and God will also appear to have form, but if one is formless, who is to see these forms, and how? Without the eye, can any object be seen? The seeing self is the eye, and that eye is the eye of infinity. Brahman is not to be seen or known. It is beyond the threefold relationship of seer, sight, and seen or knower, knowledge, and known. The reality remains ever as it is. The existence of ignorance or the world is due to our illusion. Neither knowledge nor ignorance is real. What lies beyond them, as beyond all other pairs of opposites, is the reality. It is neither light nor darkness, but beyond both. Although we sometimes speak of it as light, and of ignorance as its shadow. I am the prop for Brahman. In another place it says, I am in the heart of each one. Thus the different aspects of the ultimate principle are revealed. I take it that there are three aspects, namely one, the transcendental, two, the immanent, and three, the cosmic. Is realization to be in any of these or in all of them? Coming to the transcendental from the cosmic, Vedanta discards the names and forms as being Maya. Again, Vedanta also says that the whole is Brahman, as illustrated by gold and ornaments of gold. How are we to understand the truth? The Gita says, Brahmano hi pratist aham. If that aham is known, the whole is known. That is the imminent aspect only. You now think that you are an individual. Outside there is the universe, and beyond the universe is God. So there is the idea of separateness. The idea must go. For God is not separate from you or the cosmos. The Gita also says, I am the self, O Guru Kesa, seated in the heart of all beings. I am the beginning and the middle and also the end of all beings. Thus God is not only in the heart of all, He is the prop of all, He is the source of all, their abiding place and their end. All proceed from Him, have their stay in Him, and finally resolve into Him. Therefore, He is not separate. How are we to understand the line in the Gita, This whole cosmos forms a particle of me. It does not mean that a small particle of God separates from him and forms the universe. His Shakti is acting, and as a result of one phase of such activity, the cosmos has become manifest. Similarly, the statement Emparusha Sukta, Padosya Vizwa Bhutani, all beings form one of his parts, does not mean that Brahman is in four parts. I understand that. Brahman is certainly not divisible. So the fact is that Brahman is all and remains indivisible. He is ever realized. However, man does not know this, and it is just what he has to know. Knowledge means overcoming the obstacles which obstruct the revelation of the eternal truth that the self is the same as Brahman. The obstacles taken all together form your idea of separateness as an individual. Therefore, the present attempt will result in the truth being revealed that the self is not separate from Brahman. Can you kindly give me a summary of your teachings? They are found in the booklets, particularly in Who Am I? I shall read them, but may I have the central point of your teaching from your own lips? The central point is just the thing. 
It is not clear to me what you mean by that. That you should find the center. I come from God. Isn't God distinct from me? Who asks this question? God does not. You do. So find who you are, and then you may find out whether God is distinct from you. But God is perfect, and I am imperfect. How can I ever know him fully? God does not say so. It is you who asks the question. After finding out who you are, you may know what God is. But you have found yourself. Please let me know if God is distinct from you. It is a matter of experience. Each one must experience it for himself. Oh, I see. God is infinite and I am finite. I have a personality which can never merge into God. Isn't that so? Infinity and perfection do not admit of parts. If a finite being is apart from infinity, the perfection of infinity is marred. Thus your statement is a contradiction in terms. No, see, there is both God and creation. How are you aware of your personality? I have a soul. I know by its activities. Did you know it in deep sleep? The activities are suspended in deep sleep. But you exist in sleep, and you do now too. Which of these is your real state? Sleep and waking are mere accidents. I am the substance behind the accidents. Questioner here looked up at the clock and said that it was time for him to catch the train. He left after thanking Sri Bhagavan. So the conversation ended abruptly. What is the relation between my free will and the overshadowing might of the omnipotent? A. Is the omnipotence of God consistent with the ego's free will? B. Is the omniscience of God consistent with the ego's free will? C. Are natural laws consistent with God's free will? Yes. Free will is the present appearing to a limited faculty of sight and will. That same ego sees its past activity as falling into a course of law or rules, its own free will being one of the links in the course of law. The omnipotence and omniscience of God are then seen by the ego to have acted through the appearance of his own free will. So he comes to the conclusion that the ego must go by appearances. Natural laws are manifestations of God's will, and they have been laid down. Is God personal? Yes, he is always the first person, the I, ever standing before you. Because you give precedence to worldly things, God appears to have receded to the background. If you give up all else and seek Him alone, He will remain as the I, the Self. The final state of realization is said, according to Advaita, to be absolute union with the Divine, and according to the Visista Veta, a qualified union, while Dveta maintains that there is no union at all. Which of these should be considered the correct view? Why speculate about what will happen at some time in the future? All are agreed that the I exists. To whichever school of thought he may belong, let the earnest seeker find out what the I is. Then it will be time enough to know what the final state will be, whether the I will be merged in the Supreme Being or stand apart from him. Let us not forestall the conclusion, but keep an open mind. But will not some understanding of the final state be a helpful guide even to the aspirant? No purpose is served by trying to decide now what the final state of realization will be. It has no intrinsic value. Why not? Because you proceed on a wrong principle. Your conclusion is arrived by the intellect which shines only by the light it derives from the self. Is it not presumptuous 
on the part of the intellect to sit in judgment over that from which it derives its little light? How can the intellect, which can never reach the self, be competent to ascertain and much less decide the nature of the final state of realization? It is like trying to measure the sunlight at its source by the standard of the light given by a candle. The wax will melt down before the candle comes anywhere near the sun. Instead of indulging in mere speculation, devote yourself here and now to the search for the truth that is ever within you. Why are there so many gods mentioned? The body is only one, but how many functions are performed by it? The source of all these functions is one. It is the same with the gods. Are the gods Isvara and Visnu and their heavens, Kelas and Vekunta, real? As real as you in this body? I mean, have they got a phenomenal existence like my body? Or are they pure fictions like the horns of a hare? They do exist. If so, they must be somewhere. Where are they? In you. Then they are only my idea, something which I create and control? Everything is. But I can create a pure fiction like the horns of a hare, or a partial truth like a mirage, while there are also facts which exist irrespective of my imagination. Do the gods Isvara and Visnu exist like that? Yes. Is God subject to cosmic dissolution at the end of a cycle? Why should he be? A man who realizes the self transcends cosmic dissolution and is liberated. Why should not Isvara, God who is infinitely wiser and abler than a man? Do gods and devils also exist? Yes. How are we to conceive of supreme divine consciousness as that which is? I have been reading the five hymns. I find that the hymns are addressed by you to Arunachala. But you are a non dualist so how can you address God as a separate being? The devotee, God, and the hymns are all the self. But you are addressing God. You are specifying this Arunachala hill as God. You can identify the self with the body, so why shouldn't the devotees identify the self with Arunachala? If Arunachala is the self, why should it be specifically picked out among so many other hills? God is everywhere. Why do you specify him as Arunachala? What has attracted you from Allahabad to this place? What has attracted all these people around? Sri Bhagavan, how was I attracted here? By Arunachala. The power cannot be denied. Again, Arunachala is within, and not without. The self is Arunachala. Several terms are used in the holy books, Atman, Paramatman, Para, etc. What is the gradation among them? They mean the same to the user of the words, but they are understood differently by various persons according to their development. But why use so many words to mean the same thing? It depends on the circumstances. They all mean the self. Bara means not relative or beyond the relative. That is to say the absolute. Why worry about God? We do not know whether God exists, but we know that we exist. So first, concentrate on yourself. Find out who you are. I have just finished reading the Malayalam version of Uladu Narpadu, 40 verses. After hearing it, what about the reference to duality during one's effort and unity at the end? It refers to people who think one must begin one's spiritual striving with a dualistic idea. They say that there is God and that one must worship and meditate until ultimately the individual merges into God. Others say 
that the individual and the Supreme Being always remain separate and never merge. But let's not worry now about what happens at the end. All agree that the individual exists now. So let a man discover it. That is, discover his self. There will be time enough afterwards to find out whether the self is to merge in the Supreme or is a part of it or remain separate. Let us not forestall the conclusion. Keep an open mind. Die within and find the self. The truth will dawn upon you, all right. So why try to decide beforehand whether it is absolute or qualified unity or duality? There is no meaning in doing so. Your decision would have to be made by logic and intellect. But the intellect derives its light from the self, the highest power. So how can its reflected and partial light envisage the entire and original light? The intellect cannot attain to the self. So how can it ascertain its nature? The self alone is real. All else is unreal. The mind and intellect have no existence apart from you. The Bible says, Be still and know that I am God. Stillness is the only thing needed to realize that I am is God. The whole Vedanta is contained in the two biblical statements, I am that I am, and be still and know that I am God. What should one think of when meditating? What is meditation? It is the suspension of thoughts. You are perturbed by thoughts which rush one after another. Hold on to one thought so that others are expelled. Continuous practice gives the necessary strength of mind to engage in meditation. Meditation differs according to the degree of advancement of the seeker. If one is fit for it, one can hold directly to the thinker, and the thinker will automatically sink into his source, which is pure consciousness. If one cannot directly hold on to the thinker, one must meditate on God, and in due course the same individual will have become sufficiently pure to hold on to the thinker and sink into the absolute being. God is described as manifest and unmanifest. As the former, he is said to include the world as part of his being. If that is so, we, as part of the world, should find it easy to know him in his manifested form. Know yourself before you seek to know the nature of God and the world. Does knowing myself imply knowing God? Yes, God is within you. Then what stands in the way of my knowing myself or God? Your wandering mind and its perverted ways. I'm a weak creature. Why does not the superior power of the Lord within remove the obstacles? Yes, he will if you have the aspiration. Why should he not create the aspiration in me? Then surrender yourself. If I surrender myself, is no prayer to God necessary? Surrender itself is a mighty prayer. But is it not necessary to understand his nature before one surrenders oneself? If you believe that God will do all things that you want him to do, then surrender yourself to him. Otherwise, let God alone and know yourself. We are worldly people and are afflicted by some grief that we cannot get over. We pray to God and are still not satisfied. What should we do? Trust God. We surrender, but still there is no help. But if you have surrendered, it means that you must accept the will of God and not make a grievance of what may not happen to please you. Things may turn out differently from what they appear. Distress often leads people to faith in God. But we are worldly people. We have wife, 
children, friends, and relations. We cannot ignore them and resign ourselves to the divine will without retaining some trace of individuality. That means that you have not really surrendered, as you say you have. All you need to do is trust God. The Lord bears the burden of the world. Know that the spurious ego which presumes to bear that burden is like a sculptured figure at the foot of a temple tower which appears to sustain the tower's weight. Whose fault is it if the traveler, instead of putting his luggage in the cart which bears the load away, carries it on his head to his own inconvenience? Surrender to him and accept his will whether he appears or vanishes. Await his pleasure. If you want him to do as you want, it is not surrender, but command. You cannot ask him to obey you and yet think you have surrendered. He knows what is best and when and how to do it. Leave everything entirely to him. The burden is his, and you have no more cares. All your cares are his. That is what is meant by surrender. What about prayer? It is true that the divine will prevails at all times and under all circumstances. Recognize the force of the divine will and keep quiet. Everyone is looked after by God. He created all. You are only one among two thousand millions. When he looks after so many, will he omit you? Even common sense dictates that one should accept his will. There is no need to tell him your requirements. He knows them himself and will look after them. Are prayers granted? Yes, they are granted. No thought will ever go in vain. Every thought will produce its effect sometime or other. Thought force will never go in vain. This sounds like a doctrine far wider than personal response by an anthropomorphic god. It indicates the power of thought for good or evil, and its repercussions on the thinker. Understanding this involves a great responsibility for thoughts no less than for actions. Just as Christ indicated that to look at a woman lustfully was a sin, the same as committing adultery with her. Not from any desire, resolve, or effort on the part of the rising sun, but merely due to the presence of his rays. The lens emits heat. The lotus blossoms. Water evaporates. And people attend to their various duties in life. In the proximity of the magnet, the needle moves. Similarly, the soul or jiva subjected to the threefold activity of creation, preservation, and destruction, which takes place merely due to the unique presence of the Supreme Lord, performs acts in accordance with its karma, and subsides to rest after such activity. But the Lord himself has no resolve. No act or event touches even the fringe of his being. This state of immaculate aloofness can be likened to that of the sun, which is untouched by the activities of life, or to that of the all-pervasive ether, which is not affected by the interaction of the complex qualities of the other four elements. Religion What is yoga? Yoga, union, is necessary for one who is in a state of viyoga, separation. But really, there is only one. If you realize the self, there will be no difference. Is there any efficacy in bathing in the Ganges? The Ganges is within you. Bathe in this, Ganges. It will not make you shiver with cold. Should we sometimes read the Bhagavad Gita? Always. May we read the Bible? The Bible and the Gita are the same. The Bible teaches that man is born in sin. Man is sin. There is no feeling of being man in deep sleep. The body thought brings out the idea of sin. 
the birth of thought itself is sin. The Bible says that the human soul may be lost. The I thought is the ego, and that is lost. The real I is I am, that I am. God the Father is equivalent to Iswara, God the Son to the Guru, and God the Holy Ghost to Atman. Isvaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Beda. God appears to his devotee in the form of a Guru, Son of God, and points out to him the immanence of the Holy Spirit. That is to say that God is Spirit, that this Spirit is immanent everywhere, and that the Self must be realized, which is the same as realizing God. There is a short account of the spiritual experiences of St. Teresa. In the March number of Prabuddha Bharata, she was devoted to a figure of the Madonna, which became animated to her sight and she was in bliss. Is this the same as Saktipata? The animated figure indicates the depth of meditation. Dhyana Bala. Saktipata prepares the mind for introversion. There is a process of concentration of the mind on one's own shadow which in due course becomes animated and answers questions put to it. That is due to strength of mind or depth of meditation. Whatever is external is also transitory. Such phenomena may produce joy for the time being, but abiding peace, shanti, does not result. That is got only by the removal of avidya, ignorance. Can't we see God in concrete form? Yes, God is seen in the mind. A concrete form may be seen, but still it is only in the devotee's mind. The form and appearance in which God manifests are determined by the mind of the devotee. But that is not the ultimate experience. There is a sense of duality in it. It is like a dream or vision. After God is perceived, self-inquiry begins, and that leads to realization of the self. Self-inquiry is the ultimate route. What is the best of all religions? What is Bhagavan's method? All methods and religions are the same, but different methods are taught for attaining liberation. Why should you be liberated? Why not remain as you are now? I want to get rid of pain. To be rid of pain is said to be liberation. That is what all religions teach. But what is the method? Go back the way you came. Where did I come from? That is just what you have to find out. Did these questions arise when you were asleep? And yet you existed then. Were you not the same person? Yes, I existed in sleep. So did the mind. But the senses had merged so that I could not speak. Are you the individual? Are you the mind? Did the mind announce itself to you when you were asleep? No, but the authorities say that the individuality is different from God. Never mind about God. Speak for yourself. What about myself? Who am I? That is just what you have to find out. Then you will know everything. If you do not, it will be time enough to ask then. When I wake, I see the world and I am not changed at all. But you do not know this when asleep, and yet you exist in both states. Who has changed now? Is it your nature to change or to remain unchanging? What is the proof? Does one require proof of one's own being? Only remain aware of yourself, and all else will be known. Why then do the dualists and non-dualists quarrel among themselves? If each would attend to his own business of seeking realization, there would be no quarrel. Is the experience of the highest state the same to all, or is there any difference? The highest state is the same, 
and the experience is the same. But I find some difference in the interpretation given of the highest truth. The interpretations are made with the mind. The minds are different, so the interpretations also differ. I mean to say that the seers express themselves differently. Their modes of expression may differ according to the nature of the seeker for whose guidance they are intended. One speaks in terms of Christianity, another of Islam, a third of Buddhism, etc. Is that due to their upbringing? Whatever may be their upbringing, their experience is the same. Only the modes of expression differ according to circumstances. Different teachers have set up different schools and proclaimed different truths and so confuse people. Why? They have all taught the same truth but from different standpoints. Such differences were necessary to meet the needs of different minds differently constituted. But they all reveal the same truth. Since they have recommended different paths, which is one to follow? You speak of paths as if you were somewhere and the self somewhere else and you had to go and attain it. But in fact, the self is here and now, and you are it always. It is like being here and asking people the way to Ramana Ashram and then complaining that each one chose a different path and asking which to follow. Why do religions speak of gods, heaven, hell, etc.? Only to make people realize that they are on par with this world and that the self alone is real. The religions are according to the viewpoint of the seeker. Take the Bhagavad Gita, for instance. When Arjuna said that he would not fight against his own relations and elders in order to kill them and gain the kingdom, Sri Krishna said, Not that these, you or I, were not before, are not now, nor will be hereafter. None was born, none has died, nor will it be so hereafter, and so on. Later he developed the theme and declared that he had given the same instruction to the son, to him, to Ich Baku, etc. Arjuna raised the doubt. How can that be? You were born a few years ago. They lived ages ago. Then Sri Krishna, understanding Arjuna's standpoint, said, Yes, there have been many incarnations of myself and yourself. I know them all. But you do not. Such statements appear contradictory, but still both are right according to the point of view of the questioner. Christ also declared before Abraham was I am. What is the purpose of such descriptions in religion? Only to establish the reality of the self. Bhagavan always speaks from the highest standpoint. People will not understand the bare and simple truth, the truth of their everyday, ever-present and eternal experience. That is the truth of the self. Is there anyone not aware of the self? Yet they do not even like to hear of it, whereas they are eager to know what lies beyond, heaven and hell and reincarnation. Because they love the mystery and not the plain truth, religions pamper them, only to bring them round to the self in the end. Moreover, much as you may wander, you must return ultimately to the self. So why not abide in the self, here and now? All the scriptures are meant only to make a man retrace his steps to his original source. He need not acquire anything new. He only has to give up false ideas and useless accretions. Instead of doing this, however, he tries to grasp something strange and mysterious because he believes his happiness lies elsewhere. That is a mistake. All scriptures, without exception, proclaim that for attaining salvation, the mind should be subdued. And once one knows that control of the mind is their final aim, it is futile to make an interminable study of them. What is required for such control is actual inquiry into oneself by self-interrogation. 
Who am I? How can this inquiry and quest of the self be made by means of a studying of the scriptures? One should realize the self by the eye of wisdom. Does Rama need a mirror to recognize himself as Rama? That to which I refers is within the five sheaths, whereas the scriptures are outside them. Therefore, it is futile to seek by means of the study of the scriptures the self that has to be realized by summarily rejecting even the five sheaths. To inquire, who am I? that is in bondage, and to know one's real nature alone is liberation. To keep the mind constantly turned within and to abide thus in the self alone. Atma vichara, self-inquiry. Whereas dhyana, meditation, consists in fervent contemplation of the self as satchitananda, being consciousness bliss. Indeed, at some time, one will have to forget everything that has been learnt. The realized man stands forth as that to which all the attributes enumerated by the scriptures refer. To him, therefore, these sacred texts are of no use whatever. From Theory to Practice Shankara says that we are all free, not bound, and that we shall all return to God from whom we came, like sparks from a fire. If that is so, why should we not commit all sorts of sins? It is true that we are not bound. That is to say, the real self has no bondage. And it is true that you will eventually return to your source. But meanwhile, if you commit sins, as you call them, you have to face the consequences. You cannot escape them. If a man beats you, can you say, I am free? I am not affected by the beating and feel no pain? Let him continue beating. If you can really feel that, then you can do what you like. But what is the use of just saying in words that you are free? The ordainer controls the fate of souls in accordance with their prarabdha karma, destiny to be worked out in this life, resulting from the balance sheet of actions in past life. Whatever is destined not to happen will not happen, try as you may. Whatever is destined to happen will happen. Do what you may to prevent it. This is certain. The best course, therefore, is to remain silent. All the activities that the body is to go through are determined when it first comes into existence. It does not rest with you to accept or reject them. The only freedom you have is to turn your mind inward and renounce activities there. Are only the important events in a man's life, such as his main occupation or profession, predetermined? Or are trifling acts also, such as taking a cup of water or moving from one part of the room to another? Everything is predetermined. Then what responsibility, what free will has man? Why does the body come into existence? It is designed for the various things that are marked out for it in this life. As for freedom, a man is always free not to identify himself with the body and not to be affected by the pleasures and pains consequent on its activities. Has man any free will, or is everything in his life predetermined? Free will exists together with the individuality. As long as the individuality lasts, so long is there free will. All the scriptures are based on this fact and advise directing the free will in the right channel. Find out who it is who has free will, or predestination, and abide in that state, then both are transcended. That is the only purpose in discussing these questions. To whom do such questions present themselves? Discover that and be at peace. The only path of karma, action, bhakti, devotion, yoga, and jnana knowledge is to inquire 
who it is who has the karma. Vibhakti, lack of devotion, viyoga, separation, and ajana, ignorance. Through this investigation, the ego disappears and the state of abidance in the self in which none of these negative qualities ever existed remains as the truth. As long as a man is the doer, he also reaps the fruits of his deeds. But as soon as he realizes the self through inquiry as to who the doer is, his sense of being the doer falls away, and the triple karma destiny is ended. This is the state of eternal liberation. We are all satchitananda, being knowledge bliss. But we imagine that we are bound by destiny and have all this suffering. Why do we imagine this? Why does this state of ignorance, ajana, come over us? Ask yourself to whom this ignorance has come, and you will discover that it never came to you, and that you always have been Satchitananda. One goes through all sorts of austerities to become what one already is. All effort is simply to get rid of the mistaken impression that one is limited and bound by the woes of samsara, this life. Is there predestination? And if what is destined to happen will happen, is there any use in prayer or effort, or should we just remain idle? There are only two ways in which to conquer destiny or be independent of it. One is to inquire who undergoes this destiny and discover that only the ego is bound by it and not the self and that the ego is non-existent. The other way is to kill the ego by completely surrendering to the Lord, by realizing one's helplessness and saying all the time, Not I, but Thou, O my Lord, and giving up all sense of I and mine, and leaving it to the Lord to do what He likes with you. Surrender can never be regarded as complete so long as the devotee wants this or that from the Lord. True surrender is love of God for the sake of love and for nothing else, not even for the sake of salvation. In other words, complete effacement of the ego is necessary to conquer destiny. Whether you achieve this effacement through self-inquiry or through bhakti marga, J. Krishnamurti teaches the method of effortlessness and choiceless awareness, as distinct from that of deliberate concentration. Would Sri Bhagavan be pleased to explain how best to practice meditation, and what form the object of meditation should take? Effortless and choiceless awareness is our real nature. If we can attain that state and abide in it, that is all right. But one cannot reach it without effort, the effort of deliberate meditation. All the age-old vasanas, inherent tendencies, turn the mind outwards to external objects. All such thoughts have to be given up, and the mind turned inwards, and that, for most people, requires effort. Of course, every teacher and every book tells the aspirant to keep quiet, but it is not easy to do so. That is why all this effort is necessary. Even if we find somebody who has achieved this supreme state of stillness, you may take it that the necessary effort had already been made in a previous life. So effortless and choiceless awareness is attained only after deliberate meditation. That meditation can take whatever form most appeals to you, See what helps you to keep out all other thoughts and adopt that for your meditation. Bliss will ensure if you keep still. But however much you tell your mind this truth, it will not keep still. It is the mind that tells the mind to be still in order for it to attain bliss. But it will not do it. Though all the scriptures have said it and though we hear it daily from the great ones and even from our guru, 
we are never quiet but stray into the world of maya, illusion, and sense objects. That is why conscious, deliberate effort is needed to attain that effortless state of stillness. I want to be further enlightened. Should I try to make no effort at all? Now it is impossible for you to be without effort. When you go deeper, it is impossible for you to make effort. What is the difference between meditation and samadhi or absorption in the self? Meditation is initiated and sustained by a conscious effort of the mind. When such effort entirely subsides, it is called samadhi. If you can keep still without engaging in any other pursuits, well and good. But if that cannot be done, what is the use of remaining inactive only with regard to realization? So long as you are obliged to be active, do not give up the attempt to realize the self. Meditation is a fight. As soon as you begin meditation, other thoughts will crowd together, gather force, and try to overwhelm the single thought to which you try to hold. This thought must gradually gain strength by repeated practice. When it has grown strong, the other thoughts will be put to flight. This is the battle always going on in meditation. So long as the ego lasts, effort is necessary. When the ego ceases to exist, actions become spontaneous. No one succeeds without effort. Mind control is not your birthright. The few who succeed owe their success to their perseverance. Effort is necessary up to the state of realization. Even then the self should spontaneously become evident. Otherwise happiness will not be complete. Up to that state of spontaneity there must be effort in some form or another. Why should I try to get realization? I shall emerge from this state of illusion just as I wake up from a dream. We do not make any effort to get out of a dream when we are asleep. In a dream, you have no inkling that it is a dream, and therefore no obligation to make an effort to get out of it. But in this life, you have some intuition based on your experience of sleep, and on what you hear and read, that it is a sort of dream, and this intuition imposes on you the duty of making an effort to get out of it. However, who wants to realize the self if you don't want to? If you prefer to be in this dream, stay as you are. It is said that our waking life is also a dream, similar to our dream during sleep. But in our dreams we make no conscious effort to get rid of the dream and to wake up. The dream itself comes to an end without any effort on our part and we become awake. Similarly, why shouldn't the waking state, which in reality is only another sort of dream, come to an end of its own accord without any effort on our part and land us in realization or real awakening? Your thinking that you have to make an effort to get rid of this dream of a waking state and you're making efforts to attain realization or real awakening, are all parts of the dream. When you attain realization, you will see there was neither the dream during sleep nor the waking state, but only yourself and your real state. It is said that only those who are chosen for self-realization obtain it. That is rather discouraging. That only means that we cannot attain realization of the self by our own mind, unaided by God's grace. Bhagavan also says that even that grace does not come arbitrarily, but because one has deserved it by one's own efforts, either in this life or in previous ones. But human effort is said to be useless, so what incentive has man to improve himself? Where it is said that you should make no effort, or that effort was useless, grace is necessary for the removal of ignorance, Certainly, but grace is there all along. Grace is the self. It is not something 
to be acquired. All that is necessary is to know its existence. In the same way, the sun is pure brightness. It does not know darkness, although others speak of darkness fleeing away on its approach. Like darkness, ignorance is a phantom, not real. Because of its unreality, it is said to be removed when its unreality is discovered. The sun is there and shines, and you are surrounded by sunlight. Still, if you would know the sun, you must turn your eyes in its direction and look at it. Similarly, grace is only to be found by effort, although it is here and now. By the desire to surrender, increasing grace is experienced, I hope. Surrender once and for all and be done with the desire. So long as the sense of being the doer remains, desire does also. Therefore, the ego remains. But once this goes, the self shines forth in its purity. The sense of being the doer is the bondage, not the actions themselves. Be still and know that I am God. Here, stillness is total surrender without a vestige of individuality. Stillness will prevail, and there will be no agitation of the mind. Agitation of the mind is the cause of desire, of the sense of being the doer of personality, and if that is stopped, there is quiet. In this sense, knowing means being. It is not relative knowledge involving the triads of knower, knowledge, and known. But one may not be quite sure of God's grace. If the unripe mind does not feel God's grace, it does not mean that this is absent, for that would imply that God is at times gracious. That is to say, ceases to be God. Is that the same thing as saying of Christ, according to thy faith, be it done unto thee? Quite so. The Upanishads say, I am told that he alone knows the Atman whom the Atman chooses. Why should the Atman choose at all? If it chooses, why some particular person? When the sun rises, some buds blossom, not all. Do you blame the sun for that? Nor can the bud blossom of itself. It requires the sunlight to enable it to do so. May we not say that the help of the Atman is needed because it is the Atman that drew over itself the veil of Maya? You may say so. If the Atman has drawn the veil over itself, should it not itself remove the veil? It will. But who complains of being veiled? Ask yourself that. Why should I? Let the Atman itself remove the veil. If the Atman complains about the veil, then the Atman will remove it. If the Supreme Being is omnipresent, as he is said to be, his realization ought to be an easy thing. The scriptures, however, declare that without his grace, the Lord cannot even be worshipped, much less realized. So then, how can the individual by his own effort realize the Self or the Supreme Being, except through his grace? There was never a time when the Supreme Being was unknown or unrealized because He is one and identical with the Self. His grace or Anugraha is the same as the conscious immediacy of His Divine Presence. Prasannata, in other words, enlightenment or revelation. One's ignorance of this self-revealing immediacy of divine grace is no proof to the contrary. If the owl does not see the sun that illumines the whole world, is that the fault of the sun? Is it not due to the defectiveness of the bird's sight? Similarly, if the ignorant man is unaware of the ever-luminous Atman or self, can that be attributed to the nature of the Atman itself? Is it not the result of his own ignorance? The Supreme Lord is eternal grace. Therefore, there is really no such individual act as bestowing grace. And being ever-present, the manifestation of grace is not confined to any particular period or occasion. Doubts keep arising. 
That is why I ask how it is to be done. A doubt arises, and it is cleared. Another arises, and that is cleared. Only to make way for another, and so it goes. So there is no possibility of clearing away all doubts. Find out instead to whom the doubts come. Go to their source and stay there. Then they cease to arise. That is how doubts are to be cleared away. Only grace can help me do it. Grace is not something outside you. In fact, your very desire for grace is due to grace that is already working in you. Isn't success dependent on the grace of the Guru? Yes, but isn't your practice itself due to such grace? Its fruits spring from it automatically. There is a stanza in Kevalya which runs, O Guru, you have always been with me, watching over me, one incarnation after another, and have shaped my course until I was liberated. The Self manifests externally as the Guru when occasion demands. Otherwise, he always remains within, doing what is required. In actual practice, I find I cannot succeed in my efforts unless Bhagavan's grace descends on me. The Guru's grace is always there. You imagine it to be something somewhere high up in the sky that has to descend. But really, it is inside you, in your heart. And the moment you effect the subsidence or merging of the mind into its source by whatever method, the grace rushes forth sprouting us from a spring within you.